book of Jude, if you turn there. This is the day and time that we're living in. We're living in the book of Jude, the, the entrance into the revelation of Jesus Christ. And we are living in an age of apostasy uh, where there's uh, false doctrine all, all over. Uh, when you were in Jerusalem in the book of Acts, you didn't go from the church where the apostles went to another church or have to test which church was the right church. There was only one church. But right from the beginning, just like the devil always does, everything God is uh, uh, trying to do, the devil is trying to pervert and uh, question and cause doubt. And everything God ordains, the devil is opposing. And so we see that, of course, right here in the early church. Uh, this book, they say, was written maybe in, in A.D. 66. Uh, this is still this is by the Lord's half-brother, uh, Jude, here. And uh, quite something to think about how quickly, and isn't that true? You see that with the children of Israel, how quickly we turn away from the truth. How quickly. Jude, beginning in verse 1. Just 25 verses, we're going to read the, the whole book. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. I love how... Uh, Jude emphasizes even in a turning away, the, the, the theme to the book of Jude is assurance in the day of apostasy. Assurance. We're preserved in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah for that. If you fast forward to the end of the book, you find verse 24, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. And so our confidence is not in us, our confidence is in the Lord who has promised to preserve us and who is able to keep us from falling. And we thank God for that. Verse 2, mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And verse 3 and 4 are your theme verses, if you will, your key verses in the book of Jude. And uh, certainly the Lord Jesus had an apostate as one of his twelve. Judas is that uh, patron saint of, of, of apostasy, not the author of the, or the human penman here, but the uh, Judas Iscariot. We have our, our mascot for our school and our school verse is this verse, verse 3, because this in the day we live in, God has called us. We need to earnestly contend for the faith and the contenders. Verse 5, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness under the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael, the archangel... When contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. But these speak evil of those things which they know not. But what they know naturally as brute beasts in those things, they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them! For they have gone in the way of Cain, and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. These are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds. Trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. You here see something that is a shell, something that claims to be something but is not true through and through. It, it, it's clouds without water. It, it's, verse 13, raging waves of the sea and you could sit there by the seaside and the wave hit wave after wave after wave, but that wave is only going so far where God set the bound of the ocean, and that's all. They might rage all at once. Foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever, 
And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches with ungodly sinners have spoken against him. If you're not sure, these are ungodly people. Verse 16, these are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. How that they told you there should be mockers in the last time, who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the Spirit, but ye, beloved, building up yourselves in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God. As the old time preacher said, keep yourself under the spout where the glory come out. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ and to eternal life. And if some have compassion, making a difference. And others, save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, have your way now as we study your word. Thank you for each one here. And Lord, I pray you feed each and every one here by your spirit from your word. Lord, that we all would take something from this hour together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated there. An apostate is someone who has turned from revealed truth. If you're a believer, you can't be an apostate, but you can follow an apostate. And there is the spirit of Antichrist and a, a, a spirit of apostasy that is even in good churches. I'm not aware of anything like this in our church at all, so don't think I'm responding to some problem. But you don't build your defenses once the battle's already begun. Uh, you prepare for battle. The Bible says, uh, be sober. Be vigilant, because your adversary of the devil is a roaring lion, walking about seeking whom he may devour. Ephesians 6 tells us that uh, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might, and put on the whole arm of God, because uh, we are in a battle, and we are in a fight. And the devil is against the church, and there's no question about that. And, and so, like I mentioned earlier, uh, an apostate is someone who has turned from revealed truth. It is not someone that does Judas knew. He kissed the door of heaven. He knew the truth. He, he'd been with the truth. truth. He, had, he had, had heard the truth over and over and over, but he had chosen not to receive the truth. So apostates know, but have not, and I probably should say it even stronger, will not receive the truth. Will not receive the truth. And so uh, if the first thing, if you're here tonight and don't know the Lord as Savior, the, you need to receive the truth. Uh, knowing the truth is not enough. You have to put your faith in Christ, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Uh, you have to turn from your way and, and maybe even all that you know and say, Lord, I'm going to place my faith in not me and what I know or how good I've been, but in the Lord Jesus and what he did for me on Calvary, knowing that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Uh, that's the greatest need of anyone's life. And once you receive Christ as Savior, the Holy Spirit of God makes his abode in you. And uh, notice verse 19, we already read, the Bible says at the end there, having not the Spirit. The apostates are not saved. They do not have the Spirit of God. The Great Wall of China, something I'd love to see someday. Anyone ever been there and seen the Great Wall of China personally? All right, just curious. Um, they say it was penetrated in history at least three times. And every time it was not a fault in the wall... Every time it was a word that was bribed, that's how they breached the wall. See, a strong defense depends on strong people. And this applies in spiritual battles as well as physical conflicts. Uh, you're only as strong, as someone said, as your weakest link. And so if the church is to oppose and defeat uh, false teachers or apostates, 
uh, then all of us in the church must be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. We all must be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Uh, you notice in, uh, when you watch a lion hunt, he doesn't go after the big bull or the strongest uh, of, of the females. He goes after the baby. He goes after an injured or an old. He wants to get some, one that's not in the midst of the pack. That's why it's so good to stay in the center, right, of God's people. Don't get on the fringe. Don't get on the outside where you're open to the attack of the devil. Well, there's always a danger. There's always a danger of stumbling. A, 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 that stumble is that first, you know, towards the fall. Sometimes we stumble and we catch ourselves, right? Other times we stumble and we fall, right? And so uh, this book is written so that we might, especially this last part we're going to focus in on, that we might refuse to stumble. The Holy Spirit, through Jude, gives the beloved, he uses that term beloved several times, Four instructions to follow uh, from verses 17 to 25. If they would stand firm and resist the apostates, four instructions to follow if they were going to stand and resist the, those given to apostasy. Number one, beloved, remember God's word. Remember God's word. Uh, verse 16, it says, these are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust. Their mouth speaketh great swelling words. Uh, don't, don't, don't listen to all they're saying. Remember God's word. Having men's person admiration because of advantage. In fact, this passage right here reminds me of 2 Timothy. We're going to turn there in just a second. But beloved, remember ye. Here they're speaking all these words. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of Jesus Christ, how they, they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. It's reminiscent to me of what you see here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, where evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, verse 13. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. What do we do? But, just like he said here, but beloved, remember you the words, uh, the word of the Lord he's talking about. Verse 14, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. It's interesting. It's almost like God wrote the Bible. Uh, Paul over here in 2 Timothy is saying, yes, there's evil men and seducers, and they're waxing worse and worse. What do we do? Uh, know God's word. Uh, get in the Bible. It's all profitable to help you to know. And Jude, he said, hey, there's going to be people boasting. He's gone through more, of, more than half of his book by verse 16, and they're going to be speaking all these things. But, beloved, remember, verse 17, remember ye the words which are spoken before the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so he's saying, stay in the word of God. Uh, this is our the Word of God. Uh, hey, stay in the Word. The best cure for error is the truth. Stay in the truth. By the way, God says be simple to things which are evil. Uh, you don't have to know all the false doctrine. You don't have to, I don't think I mentioned studying Buddhism or Islam. Uh, I'd be careful with too much of that. Uh, in, in the banks, they don't teach you how to recognize all the counterfeits by touching all the counterfeits. They teach you to handle the real bills, and when a counterfeit shows up, you'll recognize it. And so the Holy Spirit of God will help you to know error. It doesn't mean you can't learn a few things about maybe someone you're trying to reach, but, but be careful delving into too much of false doctrine and opening yourselves up to things. God's Word says, go back to the Word of God, stay in the Word of God, meditate in this day and night, not into all, all these other false things. So stay in the Word of God. Remember, from the very beginning, Satan has attacked the Word of God. You find in Genesis chapter 3, the first words of Satan as he comes on the scene Yea, hath God said? It's his very first words in Genesis, in the beginning of man. Yea, hath God said? From the very beginning, he's questioned the word of God, questioned what God says, leading mankind into sin. See, once we begin to question God's word, we are vulnerable then. We open ourselves up to Satan's attack. Careful with questioning the word of God. Something that blows my mind in our day, and I've met multiples of these over the 13 years being here is people that they're looking for a church that doesn't exist they've come on to someone on the internet someone on youtube someone somewhere uh, another part of the country that uh, believes in this 
certain thing about the Bible, and if you don't teach it just like that, then you're not the right type of church. Or it's for one, it's been, uh, they believe, they ought to believe everything we do, but you ought to worship on Saturday. They're not seven days of Venice, but there are these Old Testament, and, and, and uh, there's no church around anywhere that believes or teaches that. Well, there's one way over here. And, and I, one, of the, one of the just reasonable thing, things I put to people like that is, isn't that interesting that all these people in the hallway, people that, the revivals, um, churches, uh, people for years now, hundreds of years, all the people that I look up to uh, in my day, like Brother Sexton or others, Interesting that you know more than all of them, that you've discovered something all these people that study the Word of God haven't. And there's something about that. And then, and then you find people that, that uh, uh, you know, there's one church, so we're an online member of some place, you know, in another state over, and uh, because uh, they, they like this. But they don't. Isn't that interesting that it's not anywhere? I mean, it's just so funny to me. And now I've had them even come back later embarrassed and saying, yeah, we were wrong and I got caught up in some... The, the, the whole point is that stay in the Word of God. Stay with the Word of God. Hey, it, don't, don't be so foolish, and I shouldn't be so foolish to think I've discovered something that no one else has seen in the Word of God. Hey, we better be careful. This, this is where they lead away into this false doctrine. The devil is a master of that. All the way through the Bible, we are told to remember. Remember the Word. We're told uh, not to remove the ancient landmarks, the things that has been surely, most surely believed among you. Don't remove those things so quickly. And, but people do. I, I do believe that you can stand for God in this world without tripping, but you can't do it unless you have a knowledge of the Word of God. It is essential. You must remember the Word of God. And so, first of all, under this, remember who gave the Word. Verse 17. The Lord Jesus Christ. The apostles were the ones that, that wrote it down, or these Bible writers, and he mentions specifically apostles here like Peter and Paul and John. Remember, he says, who gave these things? These are apostles of the Lord. They walked with him. They knew him. They saw him rise from the grave. And then remember what they said. Remember what they said. He says, remember the things which were spoken before, verse 17, of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, which apostles? Well, how about Peter, John, and Paul? Uh, turn over to 2 Peter, would you do that? 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter, just a couple books back here, just past the first, second, third John, you'll get into 2 Peter chapter 3. This is what he said. God's telling them to remember what the apostles spake unto you. What did they speak? 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, Sounds just like what we read over here in verse 18, how they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. Like I said earlier, it's almost like God wrote the Bible, right? Okay, keep reading, verse 4. And saying, where is the promise of His coming? That's just like the devil. Has God said? Where, where is this promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. It's interesting, the two things he mentions that they're willingly ignorant of is that God created the world and that there was a real flood. And that would say in our world today, people won't admit and won't, are willingly ignorant that God didn't create the world and that from this disorder, order came, and, and there has to be a first cause that started all this. Science teaches that. We've been learning such good things about this in the Faith Bible Institute. Whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. They, they, they want to argue about all that. Verse 7, but the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word, God's word, the word of God, verse 5, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition or destruction of ungodly. That's the same message Enoch was preaching. God's going to destroy these ungodly men, remember? We read that in verse 14 and 15, back in June. Keep reading verse 8, but beloved. thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Praise the Lord for that. Verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come, as a thief in the night, 
in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God? And, and he goes on from there. And, and he's saying, hey, listen, be, understand uh, they're going to lie, they're going to question, but it's going to happen just like God said. Stay with the Word of God. How about 1 John chapter 4? Uh, the Apostle John writes, 1 John 4, you just have two over from that. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are coming out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God, 1 John 4, 2. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, wherever you have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. And so he's telling us, don't be surprised that there's people that claim Jesus and hold a Bible that are in error and wrong. He said it's going to happen. And so we should just be saying, yep, God's word is true. Here's another false teacher. And there's going to be lots of them. He says, many, they're already in the world. That was when 1 John was being penned by the Apostle John. And we're now thousands of years later, and there's many, many more. And we know that, and we see that. 1 Timothy chapter 4, how about what the Apostle Paul said? Peter, John, now Paul. 1 Timothy 4, verse 1 and 2. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. If you ever wonder where false religion comes from, it comes from the devil. If someone asks you, where does the Catholic Church come from? It comes from the devil. I know some people have a hard time hearing that, but that's the truth. Okay, if you believe what the Pope and the Catholic Church teaches, you'll find yourself wake up in hell. And no candle, no indulgence, no someone paying enough to pray out of purgatory is not going to happen. Where did that come from? It's the doctrine of devils. Verse 2, 1 Timothy 4, 2, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Paul continues, Acts chapter 20, look there, verse 29. Acts chapter 20, verse 29, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. This sounds exactly like what Jude is writing about in verse 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares. Keep reading Acts 20, verse 31. Therefore watch. And remember, same word, remember, by the space of three years I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. He said, I preached the word, and now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up. That sounds like. Verse 20, but ye, beloved, building up yourselves on the most holy faith, and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Acts 20, uh, 29 to 32. And so they prophesied that this was going to happen. They prophesied in the last days these mockers would come who would deny the word of God. So when a warning is given like this so many times, and God is sounding the alarm over and over in the word, uh, if God says it once, we ought to take it seriously, but we better really understand that this is the day and age we live in. It's not just on some fringe place. It's not just in some uh, church that's named other than a, a Baptist church. It's, it's everywhere, in all places, the devil is working to bring in lies and deceit and false doctrine. See, before Satan can substitute his own lies, he must rid or get rid of the truth of God's word. If he can't argue it away, verse 18 He'll laugh it away. Notice he says, how that they told you there should be mockers, back in Jude, verse 18. Mockers in the last time. Y'all believe in uh, creation still? You don't believe in the gap theory or some of these other, you know, just, just straight creation. You know, you guys, Alabama, you're know, kind of hicks, you know, down there. You know? And they'll mock that we would believe the Bible just as it says. Y'all use the King James Version still? You kidding me? You know, that kind of uh, mocking, and it's everywhere. I don't know a Southern Baptist church anywhere in Alabama where I've been that uses the King James anymore. It's crazy. They've left the Word of God. And they would even mock that, that they would hold to such an outdate Bible. 
But so it's not just some, like I said, it's not just, you know, the Mormons or, or Jehovah's Witness or some group you want to point to. Uh, they're trying to come in and the devil does much more uh, work as the angel of light, much more dangerous work as the angel of light than he does as the roaring lion. And so he's working hard to do that. And then remember why they said it, not just who said it and what they said, but why they said it. Verse 19, these be they who separate themselves, they're dividers, sensual, having not the spirit. Uh, the devil is a divider, so apostates are dividers. They want to divide the church. They want to bring division. Uh, Proverbs chapter 6, these six things that the Lord hate. Uh, one of them is sowing discord among the brethren. The devil's been at that for years and years. And, and so, you know, denominations and churches even today will say uh, that those that stand for the fundamentals of the faith, you're the dividing the church. You're, you're dividing Christians. You're, you're separating. No, 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 that's not true. These denominations, these mainline denominations, these churches, like I mentioned, the Southern Baptist churches that have left the truth of the Word of God, and they have left us. We haven't left them. Uh, there's people that come from churches like that that say, uh, my church left me. I have to look for another church, but my church once stood on these things, but they've moved, they've left, see. And that's what God said they would do. They're leaving the fundamentals of the faith of God's Word. See, apostates in a church or those believers that are truly saved but following in the ways of apostasy cause division among the members in a church. They cause division in a Sunday school class. They cause division among the pastor and leadership, really any authority. And it always begins with whispering. And it just gets louder and louder and louder until they're finally shouting. How do you deal with this as a, as a loyal church member? How do you deal with someone that, that when you're striving to keep the unity and the bond of peace, as the Bible says? Well, first of all, I think you have to speak up kindly, with the love of Christ, graciously, but firmly, and say, look, you don't do this. Uh, think about it if people would have grabbed those ten men at Kadesh Barnea and said, no, no, we're not listening to your evil report. We believe our God. But they swayed the people with their evil report about the giants and the food hungry that they were doing. And so you say, look, you don't do this. We're not going to rebel against God. We read in our January Bible reading, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, how many times, let's stone Moses, let's, let's get rid of Moses, and let's get, make us a captain, and let, let's go back to Egypt. They weren't rebelling against Moses. Moses said, did I bear all these people? These are God's people. You're rebelling against God. This wasn't Moses' idea. This is God's idea. And so when we when we uh, hear this type of whispering type of thing, look, you don't want to rebel against God. Because that's what it is. You don't say, you don't want to do that. See, true love and compassion for people is warning them of destruction. Uh, not, not going along with it because you don't want to hurt their feelings. I, I like it, this thought. Love is the fence at the top of the cliff. True love is rather than the ambulance at the bottom, right? And we want to help at both, but oh, stop them from it. Just like a nation... A church goes bad when good people do nothing. See, the first time, and, and I mentioned Southern Baptist, so I don't mind continuing that path. The first time someone brought in the music that they have, someone said no. It always started in the teenagers. No, we're not having that type of music with our young people. My, my, my teenagers are not listening to that. We're not bringing the world's music in. That's what they should have done. They should have stopped it. This new youth director you hired, we're not having it. No, they should have stood up. Not unkind, not mean, but these are my children. We're not corrupting them with the things of the world. We're not taking our children back to Egypt just to get a few more of them. No, but they didn't say anything. The first time uh, someone said we're going to change the Bible, they should have said, no, we're not changing it. But what happened? Why didn't they? If you go back to the source, it's because they didn't know the Word of God to start with. So he says the way to protect against it, remember God. Word. Stay with the Word of God. You have to, beloved, remember God's Word. Remember God's Word. See, our tendency, if we're not careful, is to say, well, it's just a small thing. That's how it always begins. See, it's always a little flame first, right? It's a little, little fire, a little fox. It's just a, a little leaven, right, that begins to leaven the lump. And so we have to be on guard. No, we should be kind. We should have the love of Christ. 
but we need to know the Word of God and we just need to stand with the Word of God. Number two, under this, as you think about uh, the devil here, he's not only a divider, but he's a deceiver. Not big number two, just under this. Why they said it. He's a deceiver. Apostates are deceivers. They deceive the church. They don't come in and say, we don't like your doctrine, we're going to change it all. That's not how they come in. But they begin to deceive. Remember what it says in verse 19. These be they who separate themselves sensual, having not the Spirit. Now, I know when we hear sensual, we immediately uh, think of, of the word uh, of a sexual connotation, but that's not what it's talking about here. It's, it's, a, it's an opposite here. Sensual, having not the Spirit. You may have even a little mark beside your, in your Bible where it says natural. It's talking about natural man versus the spiritual man. They don't have the spirit, and so they are natural men. They're deceivers. The word sensual here is the opposite of spiritual. Uh, sensual means a life that centers around the individual, the natural man. I, me. How can you discern between a sensual and the spiritual? by using the Word of God, by play, paying close attention to the witness of the Spirit of God within. See, a sensual ministry magnifies man. A natural man, a sensual as he uses the term here, it magnifies man, but the spirit, the spiritual ministry will glorify Christ. See, when the Spirit is ministering through the Word, there's edification. But when the sensual, the natural man, is merely manufacturing a ministry, there's entertainment. Let me say that again. When the Spirit is ministering through the Word, there's edification. People are built up and strengthened spiritually, built up, matured, brought, grown up spiritually. But when the sensual man, when the natural man is merely manufacturing a ministry, there's entertainment. A Christian is baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ. He's sealed by the Spirit. Think of this. We're indwelt by the Spirit. We're taught by the Spirit. We're led by the Spirit. You cannot be a Christian unless you have the Spirit. And these people do not. The Holy Spirit of God in the book of Jude, as if you study the book, has so identified these apostates that if we'll be alert, if we'll be on guard, if we'll know the Word of God, we should easily be able to recognize the spirit of Antichrist, the spirit of apostasy, those turning from the truth. What about to know the Lord. We, there should be these opposite identifiers in us. We should have the opposite identifiers. Our separation should be unto the Lord and from the world. That's where our separation should be. Our lives should not be marked by sensual living. It should be marked by faith in God. It should be marked by the Holy Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit. If we've truly been born to God's family, we're indwelt by the Spirit. So number one, beloved, remember the word of God. And we're just going to look at two of these tonight. Number two, beloved, build your Christian lives. Look at it says in verse 20. But ye, beloved, verse 17 it said, but beloved, remember ye the words, talking about the word of God. Verse 20, but ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, unto eternal life. Now it says here, building up yourselves on your most holy faith. What's he referring to there? Well, the Bible says in verse 3, uh, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And so here in verse 20, that, that your most holy faith, again, is talking about the same thing, the faith, or... You could just make it the Bible, the, the body of doctrine that has been delivered unto us, the faith. Build yourselves up on that. Let me give you another passage on that. Look at 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. He's saying we're to build up on our faith. Look, look at 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 5. After opening remarks here, and talks about what God has given us in Christ and things in 2 Peter chapter 1. Look at verse 5. And beside this, giving all diligence... Add to your, what? Faith, or build up on your faith. Add to your faith, virtue. And to virtue, knowledge. And to knowledge, temperance. And to temperance, patience. And to patience, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren 
nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so he's saying that, that uh, hey, you need these things. You need to be built up so you can produce fruit, but also you can be aware and be uh, uh, strong in the Lord as you are fighting or in a battle. He says, but ye, verse 20, but ye, God, God wants your attention. He said, beloved, remember the words. But then verse 20, he says, but ye, beloved. What they, he want, God wants our attention. Hey, you need to build your Christian life. It's not enough just for you to be saved or you even to come to church. You need to be purposely building. Like some of you work out and exercise and purposely are building muscles physically. You need to be purposely building up your, in, in the faith, on top of the faith in Christ Jesus, the faith that you have that, the most holy faith what God has given us, you're to be building on that. It's got to have your attention. There's a story about an old farmer who had a mule. And uh, his neighbor bought the mule from him. And uh, he says, a good mule. And so the next day, the, the neighbor's out there, and he's wanting to uh, get the, far, the, the mule to plow, and the, the mule won't do it, won't do anything. He's telling him to plow and over and over telling him, and so he calls his neighbor back over. They bought it from him and says, hey, I need some help with this mule. And so the other farmer walks over. There's a limb falling off a tree, picks up this big limb, two by four, and bam, knocks that mule over the head, knocks the mule to the ground. Bends down and whispers into his ear, now plow. Mule jumps up, starts plowing. He says, I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you, you've got to get his attention first. Does God have your attention? See, beloved, Build. He says, but ye, but ye, not someone else, ye, beloved, building up yourselves in your most holy faith. The Christian is to be contending and building. It's like the example of Nehemiah in the Old Testament. Nehemiah chapter 4, 17, 18 says, They which build it on the wall, and they that bear the burdens, with those that laid it, every one with one of his hands wrought in the work, and with the other hand held a weapon. For the builders, everyone had his sword girded by his side, and so builded, and he that sounded the trumpet was by me. Nehemiah 4, 17, 18. So the people of God in Nehemiah's day were trying to do a work for God, but they had enemies. Like verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence around to you of the common salvation, it was need for me to write to you and exhort you should earnestly contend for the faith. That's that sword. Contending for the faith which you want delivered. You've got to contend. That's the, the sword in Nehemiah chapter 4. But verse 20 is oh, But ye, beloved, building up yourselves in your most holy faith. Praying the Holy Ghost. We must fight the enemy, but we also must be constructing a spiritual house that will please the Lord. Building on that foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, gold, silver, precious stones. We're to be building a, a spiritual house. See, neither of the two things can be... Uh, ignored. Neither of them can take precedence over the other. We can't just be contending without building. If we do, we're out of balance. But we, at the same time, uh, we're, we're, we can't just um, build without contending. Both must be done. We're to build ourselves, self, ourselves in the faith, and we're also to contend earnestly for the faith. How do we do that? How do I build my Christian life? Well, we go back to where we started, the Word of God. Acts 20, 32, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. We read it earlier. Acts 20, verse 32. Paul said, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. So you build your Christian life by the word of God. The mockers described in verse 18 and 19, they break down the work of God. But the beloved of verses 20 to 23 here build it up. By the word of God. And so we build ourselves up by applying the teachings of the scriptures to our life. Remember, faith cometh by hearing the word of God. The Bible says in Romans 17, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. Uh, so our faith is built up by the word of God. And then cleansing from sin is provided by the word of God. Ephesians 5, 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Psalm 119, 9, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed according to, his word, according to thy word. And then uh, obedience to the word brings blessings untold. James 1, 25, but whoso looketh at the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he be not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, 
This man shall be blessed in his deed. 1 John 2, 5, But whoso keepeth his word in him, verily is the love of God perfected. When we desire it, we'll grow. Verse 1 Peter 2, 2, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. And so the word of God is, is how we build up or build our Christian life. The gifted Chinese preacher, Watchman Nee, used to read through the New Testament once a month. He read through the New Testament once a month. The members of the Chinese church used to have the saying, no Bible, no breakfast. I'd like to hear that in Chinese or Mandarin. No Bible, no breakfast. If we followed that motto in America, how many of us would have breakfast? How many of us would go hungry? So you build yourself by the word of God. Then he says in verse uh, 20, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, the word of God. Then he says, praying in the Holy Ghost. So secondly under this, by praying in the Holy Ghost, you build yourself. By praying in the Holy Ghost. See, the Word of God and prayer go together. When we, the Bible says the Holy Spirit of God is helping us as we pray. The Bible says that Jesus is praying for us. I like that idea, the thought of our Father. Anytime you kneel to pray, the Holy Spirit of God is there. The Lord Jesus is praying with you. The Word of God and prayer go together in spiritual growth. It's both sides of the conversation. I'm, I'm hearing from God as I read the Word of God, and I'm praying, I'm talking to God, and it doesn't even, it shouldn't even be separate things like, okay, I'm reading now, and then later I'm going to kneel and pray. Uh, we should be praying as we read. It's a conversation with God. Lord, what are you saying to me? Uh, Spirit, you, you, Jesus promised he would guide us in all truth. What is this verse saying? Help me understand, give understanding, and he'll do that. If all we do is read and study the Bible, we'll have a great deal of light, but we won't have much power. But if we only concentrate on prayer and ignore the Bible... We could be guilty of zeal without knowledge. We need both. Evangelist Billy Sunday used to give his converts three rules for success in the Christian life. Billy Sunday. Number one, each day they were to read the Bible and let God talk to them. Rule number two, they were to pray. Or in other words, they were talk, to talk to God. So let God talk to them. They were to talk to God. And then the third was they were to witness. So they were to talk to others about God. So they were to let God talk to them, they were to talk to God, and then they were to talk to other people about God. That was his three rules for success in the Christian life, Evangelist Billy Sunday. What does praying the Holy Spirit mean? It simply means to pray according to the leading of the Spirit. Uh, praying according to the leading of the Holy Spirit. We're to be dead to self and alive to the Spirit. We're to be not drunk with wine or excess, but be ye, what? Filled with the Spirit. And so it's been well said, prayer is not getting man's will done in heaven. Prayer is getting God's will done on earth. 1 John 5, 14, 15 says that this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that we, he hear us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. And so when the believer is yielded to the Spirit, then the Spirit will assist in his prayer life. God will answer prayer. Then we build up ourselves by abiding in God's love. Verse 21, keep yourselves in the love of God. Keep yourselves. It's like uh, when it's, if you're ever out like a day today in the shade, it was kind of cold, but you get in the sun, man, it felt pretty good. You feel that warmth of the sun from a gas today. And, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's warmth there. Or uh, if it's raining out, keep yourself under the umbrella, right? And you don't get rained on. Keep yourself under that. It means you have to move when God moves. You have to walk in step with God. He said, follow me. Uh, we're to, uh, the, the word of God is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. God is on the move. Uh, Hudson Taylor said, God's work is always advancing. And so we have to keep ourselves in the love of God. We have to keep ourselves near the shepherd. We can't be that sheep wandering off. We stay with the shepherd. The shepherd moves, we move. The shepherd stops, we stop. So abiding in God's love. John 15, 9, as the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Then he says, continue ye in my love. Continue ye in my love. You think about God, wants, he loves you whether you're in church or not, but when you're in church, you're continuing his love. God loves you whether you read your Bible or not, but when you read your Bible, you're continuing in his love. See, the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15, when he left home, did the father still love him? Sure, he was looking for him every day, I believe. He was looking for him that day he came back. He saw him and ran to him, didn't he? Oh, he loved him the whole time. He 
still beloved by his father the whole time he was in the far country, but he had removed himself from the place where he could enjoy the father's love. Hadn't he? Yeah. All of us, we've done that at times in our Christian life. We've removed ourselves from God. The blessings of the father's love. Enjoying the father's love to the fullest because we've, we've, we've got outside of his umbrella of protection. He, he's called us like he did Jerusalem. Hey, come to me. Get, get under my wings. How often I want to gather you as a chicken it gathers when there's danger or there's rain or under the hand. But you would. As Christians, we can wander, can't we, as well? The prodigal didn't keep himself in the love of the Father. It simply means to obey God's word and to abstain from sin in order for God to continue to bless us. So often we tie the Lord's hands, don't we? He wants to bless us, just like we want to bless our children. But when, when you get in a fight at school, you don't get ice cream after school, right? I mean, that's not going to happen, right? That's the way it is in, 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 in the physical parenting relationship, unless someone's just a bad parent or a neglectful parent, right? They're a permissive parent. But they're not going to give them ice cream. They got in trouble at school. They got in a fight. No way. Well, the Lord, how often we tie his hands. He longs to bless. He desires. But we're not doing what is right. We're not obeying and following him. He can't bless us. And then we keep ourselves, or, or we build up ourselves on our most holy faith. We build up our Christian life by looking for Christ's return. Lastly, verse 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Boy, it, it gets sweet as you're looking every day. Well, maybe today, Lord, I'll see you face to face. Even so, come Lord Jesus. The rapture could happen today. Boy, it helps you as you pray with people that have lost a loved one. Maybe before this day's out, we'll be with them. We'll all be reunited. Titus 2.13 says, looking for that blessed hope. And the grace of appearing, appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Jude verse 2 says, mercy unto you and peace be... And love be multiplied. Be multiplied. It's multiplied to us now, but we'll have it in its perfection when we get to heaven. He says here, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Now, looking means earnestly expecting. I'm expecting God to come back today. Boy, it helps you live right. It helps you be motivated to serve God. The attitude of our God may come today. I want to be found so doing. I want to be found serving him. Apostates, they can look only for judgment, but God's people, we're looking for mercy. Our mercy's coming. The Lord Jesus is coming. If we as Christians really believe the Lord was coming this week, it would change how we lived. We would live ready. We would believe it, that God is coming. Luke 12, 40, Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh in an hour when you think not. And so live looking mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. We'll conclude tonight. The Holy Spirit through Jude gives the beloved four instructions. We'll look at the other two in the future. That would help him stand firm and resist the apostates. Number one, beloved, remember, though God, beloved, remember God's word. Number two, beloved, build your Christian lives. Nothing worthwhile just happens. It takes hard work. Study to show thyself a to God. A workman that need not be ashamed, rightly divide the word of truth. Stay in the word of God, the anchor. This is how to build up your life. This is how. Remember, he says, God's word. I'll end with this. A door-to-door salesman came uh, to a lady's house and asked if she had a copy of the Bible. And she said, I certainly do, with some pride kind of in her voice. The next question, he said, did you re- do you read it regularly? She responded, oh, yes, and sent her daughter to go get the Bible from the table drawer there. As she showed it to the salesman, uh, her Bible, her, her glasses fell out of the Bible <laughs> between the pages there. Without thinking what she said, she exclaimed, ah, there's my glasses. I've been looking for them for three years. <laughs> hey, let's read God's word. Let's study. Let's be strong in the Lord. Let's grow in His Word. Jesus is coming soon. Praise the Lord. We're looking for Him. Will you bow with me in prayer?